doesn't matter what uh, you can wreck up here. Uh, so uh, it's happy to see everybody. We appreciate you being here on this last night. We look forward to one more lesson. If he's done pretty well. We think we're going to let him speak one more night. Uh, we, we appreciate Mark being here. Mark Stevens again, the minister at yeah, Elwalk. Uh, we, we do appreciate you all supporting this gospel meeting, and we're very fortunate to have him with us. Um, so turn to 874 in your song books, Brother Bill Hall, with your song service this evening. Uh, Brady will have our opening prayer, and Gilbert Firestone at uh, the proper time will have our closing prayer. A couple of uh, folks will remember her prayers. Gail had a, uh, a good procedure, I understand, yesterday. But of course, she was, I think she's still kind of getting over some of that procedure and some of that uh, anesthesia that she, uh, she had yesterday. But they, they're still, I think they're going to read that and decide how they're going to uh, proceed with her little heart issue. Uh, Donna's mother, uh, Bill's wife, uh, Donna's mother is not feeling well, had, kind of had a bad week, and uh, so Donna's with her. Uh, any, any other sick that we need to be thinking about? As far as area uh, things going on, uh, Gateway's Gospel Meeting starts Sunday with T.J. Gifford uh, through Wednesday of next week, 7 o'clock every night. Do, do our best, I guess, to try to support their, their gospel meeting. The DJ is a, just a fantastic preacher, if you've never heard him. Uh, again, he was a young man who grew up in Madisonville. And, uh, when he was just a little kid, he uh, worshiped with us at Liberty Hill, and he's grown into quite the, quite the gospel preacher. Uh, and then uh, the rest of this week uh, is the Union Grove Bible School is going on. The rest of this week, uh, tomorrow night and Friday uh, at uh, 7 o'clock. Their Bible school is there at uh, Union Grove. Any any other things going on at any, any other congregation? All right, we look forward again to some good lessons. So then we'll enter into our song service. Eight seven four. <coughs>
invitation to be number 904. Go ahead and mark your books. Number 904. Song before the lesson will be number 853. 
for being out here with us for this gospel effort. Uh, as always, I'd like to thank Patty for uh, having me. I appreciate you all so much and the work that you do in the community. Thankful for the good hospitality you've shown this week. We had two good meals on Sunday, very good food, good cooks. And everybody's been so nice and, and has given me so much encouragement. And we all need encouragement, so I need it as much as anybody else. And so I appreciate your kindness and hospitality. I'm thankful for the opportunity, as I've said, it's, it's always an honor and a privilege to teach God's Word. I'm grateful that Joe thinks I did okay, so he didn't fire me before the meeting was over. So, that Joe, I appreciate that. So you only got to put up with me just tonight, and then, then we'll be done. So it's... Uh, always comes to a quick end. It seems like we just got started and, and we're already at the last night, but hopefully the lessons have been profitable, beneficial for you, and I hope that you can say that I have taught nothing but the truth and things that would be pleasing to God, because that's my goal. That's what I want to do. So tonight we want to finish up with our last lesson. Our theme has been Contemporary Church Challenges, and we started out looking at some external challenges, things outside the church from the, the wicked culture that we live in and how those things try to encroach on the people of God. And then we shifted, and last night we looked at some internal problems among religious people themselves and how they can misuse God's word to try to go along with the culture that we live in. And so tonight we also want to look at something that is it's more internal. This is a problem among religious people, those that claim to be believers in God and believers in the Bible. And Joe actually said something about this uh, particular topic on Sunday, and he didn't know that I was going to talk about it. Uh, but I thought, well, that's appropriate that he mentioned something uh, about this particular topic, knowing that, well, we're going to get to this, Lord willing, at the end of the week. So the title of our lesson tonight is Showtime. Showtime. It seems that there are many people today that are bored. What are they bored with? Well, we're talking about being bored with the worship service. 
people that demand that we should make changes to the worship service. We should adapt to the times. We need to get into the 21st century, they will tell us. And if not, if we're not willing to do that, then they'll leave. And there's a lot of people that will leave the church or will tell you they won't come to church unless you're going to make these changes. And they'll leave not even for doctrine, but for this particular reason, because they think it's old-fashioned and, and it's boring. Now, this is a, a trend that's especially disturbing among our young people. But I am thankful to say not all of them. A lot of young people are still very dedicated to the church and, and God's work. But... A lot of the young people, they've been raised in a, in a culture that kind of centers on these kind of things. And so some will argue that, well, we've got to modernize our church services if we want to keep our young. You know, we, we've got to kind of keep pace with what the culture out there is doing because that's what they're exposed to and that's what they want. And we're going to lose them if we don't. So tonight we'd like to examine some of the facets of this particular problem. So a good place to start would to be try to examine what are some of the, the causes maybe of this boredom with the worship services. Why are people bored? Well, there could be several likely reasons. I want to mention two tonight. The first one is we do have to acknowledge that, you know, it might be possible that some congregations are very cold, they're very uninspiring in their worship to God. You can tell when you go that it seems like everybody's just going through the motions. They really don't mean it, or, or at least they don't seem like they're putting anything into it. There's no passion there, and they're just kind of doing what they're supposed to do. In that case, it probably wouldn't hurt to have some more enthusiasm in what they're doing, because we need to be enthusiastic, because every time we get together like this, this is an opportunity to worship the creator of the universe. The opportunity to worship the one who created you and me in his image. And so we ought to be enthusiastic, and frankly, some people probably are not. Now, more likely, in a majority of the cases that we're seeing, the reason probably that is that the boredom results from individuals' personal goals. You look at this and think, okay, what do they want out of a worship service? What do they expect to get out of a worship service? And maybe this is where the boredom is coming from. They want emotional stimulation. A lot of people do today. That's what they're looking for. They want to experience God, or they'll say, I want to feel God next to me, an emotional experience. They want to have fun. And feel good. <clears throat> In short, and this is what Joe mentioned on Sunday, they want entertainment. They want to be entertained in the worship service. They want to have fun. That's what they're looking for. And this is where the source of the boredom comes from. Okay, But as we examine this, the boredom is simply a symptom of a deeper spiritual issue. Because if this is their thinking, if this is the way they feel, then they, I would argue, they have a heart problem. That's what the real issue is. The boredom is just a, a symptom of that. They have a heart problem. The primary focus for them has shifted away from God, which is where it's supposed to be, and it's shifted toward their own interests. They were thinking, okay, what am I going to get out of this? What, what, how is this going to benefit me? And that's what their focus is. We need to view worship. Look, this is a time to praise God, to honor God, to glorify God. That's why we're here. That should be our purpose. But some view worship as a time to get something for themselves. They've got the wrong focus. Now, we should expect something for ourselves. It's not wrong to do that, but what we should expect is we should expect to be uplifted. We should expect to be encouraged. That's why God wants us to assemble. We are to encourage one another. We do that through the prayers, through the singing, through everything that we do. We are trying to uplift and encourage each other. So we should expect to get that. We ought to expect 
to uh, if I come to worship and I do what is pleasing to God, I ought to feel good about that. But this is not the focus that a lot of these people have. So if you will, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. As always, I encourage you, please follow along in these scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Some people have decided they are going to serve themselves rather than God by putting themselves at the center of worship. And they're not supposed to be at the center. You and I are not supposed to be at the center. Now, God warned us about this very thing. So look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be, notice this, lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady-minded, notice, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And notice he says here, from such turn away. Well, turn over to Romans chapter 1. So we see here, lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That, again, that describes the modern culture that we live in, the pleasure seekers. Okay, But they want to get this out of the worship service as well as out in the world. And God, again, he warned us about it and said, turn away. Those people are not following what God would have them to do. And so our, our goal always is to get them to repent and have the right attitude. If they won't, then we're to turn away from those people. Look at Romans 1 and verse 25. The Bible says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Serving the creature, serving the creation instead of serving the creator. And God is warning us about this. So when we substitute anything, we put anything in the place of God in the worship service, how can we possibly claim that we are pleasing unto him? How can we say, oh, I worship God. I I know I did what God wanted when we have replaced him with our own selfish desires. And yet that's what a lot of people do. Too many people are asking the wrong questions, not realizing, look, if we replace God, we've sinned against him. And we ought to be able to understand that. The worship service is not about me. It's about him. That's why we're here. At least it's ought to be why we're here. I'm reminded of a very famous quote that I'm sure you all know it probably by President John F. Kennedy on his inauguration in January of 1961. You've all heard this, right? And so Kennedy in his speech said, and some of my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Well, a lot of people have taken this into the worship service, right? And so they're asking, what can God do for me? What is God going to do for me? When we ought to be asking, what is it can I do for God? That's the question we ought to be concerned with in the worship service. Not what he's going to do for me. What can I do for him? I'm here for him. Okay? And some people just, they get that backwards because we have to consider, hasn't God done enough for us already? He's done more than enough. I'm pretty sure putting his son on the cross, not for his sins, but for mine, that's more than enough. Okay? I don't need to demand other, well, Lord, you need to do this for me and do that for me. and You need to make this worship service about me and make it exciting. I don't need to be doing that. I need to do it the way God told us to do it. That's what I need to be concerned with. So let's talk for a few minutes about these efforts to meet these needs that people, they, they come in and they, they want to be entertained. Well, 
So a lot of religious groups have turned to what they call contemporary services. And some of them will have both. And they'll call, we've got contemporary service at 10 and we have traditional service at 11. And a lot of people have interpreted that to mean the cool service and the boring service. And that, that's the way the modern culture defines it, right? Contemporary and traditional. So what are they doing to, to meet these needs? Well, a lot of the denominations, and we have good friends there, and again, we're not questioning their sincerity, but a lot of our denominational friends, they are modernizing their services in an effort to meet the cultural expectations and unfortunately there are quite a few congregations that carry the name Church of Christ they're doing exactly the same thing I've seen some of these myself doing the same thing well what does that entail exactly well let me give you some examples so you might have sermons that are replaced you might have a sermon but it's a little it would look a little different or maybe they're replaced with drama skits, or puppet shows, or dancing, or comedy routines, or psychology, a lot of things besides the gospel. And that's what you will see in these places. The, marriage, uh, the message they have is designed to be very simple, it's designed to be very enthusiastic, and it's designed to be, above all, positive got to be positive okay we don't want any negativity so negativity is either strongly reduced or maybe eliminated altogether we don't want anything negative in the service and so they will label this a lot of groups label this praise and worship that's what they call well why don't you come to praise and worship okay and that's the key for this and so that's characterized you see by loud upbeat music generate you know trying to generate enthusiasm and along with very casual or relaxed dress and attitude. And I've seen a lot of places over there in Etowah, you know, they have these signs. Come as you are. If you're headed to the lake, come on into your bathing suit. We don't care. Just kind of a very casual, relaxed atmosphere. And we hope to see why that's not necessarily something that God would approve of. Okay, but again, trying to cater to the culture and, and get more people. So the goal is basically to entertain kind of like TV or the movies, okay? So I wanna read you just a little bit. This was an article cut out of the paper several years ago, okay? And this is about uh, Westwood Baptist Church in Cleveland, but again, this could apply to a lot of places. This was in the paper, so this, I'm not trying to pick on them in particular, but you see this in a lot of places. But they're talking about, they wrote this article about how they were updating their services. Okay, so it says something hot is brewing at Westwood Baptist Church, and that something is not only a fresh pot of coffee, but the opportunity to experience God in the comfort of a coffee house setting with the new Thursday night worship service. Okay, and it talked about the preacher, and there, there's a picture of him, he's very casually dressed, and he's sitting there drinking his coffee like he's on his back porch or something, and this is the relaxed atmosphere they encourage. And so the preacher said, the service takes the concept of, of a Bible study, fellowship, and worship, and combines them to blur the lines of all three. Not only will the weekly services feature coffee bars and an espresso machine, but also multimedia presentations using video, drama, and a contemporary band and people's personal stories to present the message. And then kind of as an afterthought, he says, and among those elements, there will always be the element of truth from God's word, the Bible. So it's like, that's not our main focus, but oh yeah, we might mention the Bible too. And, and I'm sure they do some, but he's showing that the, the primary focus is going to be on this because we want people to have a good time and, and be relaxed and, and that sort of thing. So for a lot of people, the worship service has become more like a Hollywood production. Again, like a TV show or a movie. Well, let's make this entertaining. Uh, one church that I read about they have a $500,000, half a million dollar special effects machine, like you would see on a Hollywood set. You really need that in a worship service? Well, they think you do. Half a million dollars they spend on that. They have a 25 piece orchestra, because people like that, right? They said, 
according to them, they said, we learned all about showmanship from Las Vegas casinos. So they're trying to pattern their church after Las Vegas casinos, which again is very popular with the world, but is that something that God would approve of? Well, they didn't really consider that. One church I read about even staged a wrestling match between uh, people that worked at the church because they were trying to boost their Sunday night attendance. And so they thought that would generate some excitement. We'll have the church secretaries get in a ring and they'll wrestle each other. And then maybe more people will show up. Not making this stuff up, right? It, it's really kind of unbelievable. Let me read you a couple of quotes from some of these groups, some of the things that they're emphasizing. And notice not really anything about the Bible or the scriptures or what God wants, it's what they want. <laughs> Okay, here's a quote. We offer state-of-the-art video graphics, drama, and comfortable theater seats. You'll love our free coffee, soft drinks, and donuts. No mention of the Bible. Some cater to a generation of churchgoers who, quote, care passionately about dazzling entertainment. Okay, we're going to cater to a generation of churchgoers who care passionately <coughs> about dazzling entertainment. How tragic. Wouldn't it be better if they cared passionately about serving God? That's what they're supposed to be there for. But no, they care about dazzling entertainment. So we're going to provide that for them because that's what they want. I love this one. It says, we don't allow any music in our church to which you couldn't roller skate. That's vitally important. I know we talk about that at Edelwall all the time. I'm sure y'all do it Patty here too, right? Got, got to be able to roller skate. That's important. Do we care what God thinks? Oh, no. We just we want to make sure everybody's entertained. So I'm glad that they've got their priorities in order. One I read about, there was a preacher that they had the smoke machine, and he did the little message, and he was attached to wires, and they brought him up to the roof like he was going to heaven. You know, it's a theatrical production. Others, they bring live animals onto the stage. You know, it's just, it's amazing. The modern church buildings, if you see a lot of these, they build them like theaters where there's a focus on a stage instead of a pulpit so they can have their dramas and, and those kind of things. A lot of churches around the country are hiring media specialists, stage directors, choreographers, drama coaches, using God's money to pay for all these positions again so they can put on a Hollywood production. Critiquing what they say, well, we wasted too much time on that, you know, we gotta keep, keep things moving so people don't get bored. And that's what they're trying to do. Well, these are just some of the examples. We could look at a whole lot more and you guys can find them yourself. There's all kinds of uh, examples out there. But let's look at what are the problems with this? Why is this not something that God would approve of because that's ultimately that's what we want to know my opinion doesn't matter because frankly yeah if God's okay with this then I'm okay with this but what we want to see is well what does God tell us what, what are we supposed to do in the worship service well first of all let's think about how do they justify doing these kind of things spending that kind of money and doing these things how do they justify it well quite simply they say that, well, if we do these things, again, based on the modern culture, and we do live in an entertainment culture, so they say, well, that will increase our attendance. A lot more people will come to church if they're entertained, if it's exciting, if they have a good time. And you know what? I'm sure they're right. And the numbers bear that out. So you see a lot of places where those kind of services, their attendance numbers are much higher than the traditional service. So they are bringing in more people. Okay, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but the idea, again, the problem is, is what they're doing to bring people in, they're re reinforcing the idea of a man-centered, self-serving type of worship. That's what it takes to get people to come in. So this takes the focus away from God, which is where it's supposed to be. That's where it belongs. So think about, you know, the primary objective of worship is to, oh, I don't know, worship 
and glorify God. That's the primary objective, but not for these people. Let's just do whatever we got to get to, to get people in. Our primary objective should not be to entertain ourselves. That's not what it's about. But that's what they're doing to get people in. Now, here's some of the problems with if we were to do this. And as I said, it's, it's creeping in. It's one of those things, well, that can't happen here. Yes, it could. We got to watch out for these kind of things because we want to do, I know you want to do what's pleasing unto God. That's why you're here tonight. You want to please God. You want to do what makes him happy in worship. And so we want to notice, okay, what's wrong with doing something? I mean, after all, if it brings more people in, well, for one thing, if you'll turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, we want to notice that it diminishes the sense of awe and reverence that we are supposed to have for the creator of all things. It makes people think that they can treat God like one of the boys. Like God is our fishing buddy. I've seen videos of in some churches when they pray to God, they say, they start off the prayer, hey, Big Daddy, how's it going? They call God Big Daddy, like he's their fishing buddy. God is not our fishing buddy. That's like you and me would talk to each other. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to talk to the creator of all things that way. But a lot of people do. I'm good. Okay? So look at Hebrews chapter 12, because we want to notice how disrespectful that is. And note that this is serious business. What we are here to do is serious business. God takes it seriously. You and I better take it seriously. So look at Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So did you catch that? We may serve God acceptably. That shows us there's an unacceptable way to serve God. Because a lot of people will tell you, hey, it doesn't matter. As long as you're offering up whatever worship you want, God will accept it. That's not what the Bible says. There is acceptable worship and there is unacceptable worship. So it says if we want to acceptably worship him, it has to be with reverence and godly fear. God said to call him our father. We talked about that the other night, not big daddy. Hey, buddy, what's happening? You know, we're talking like we would to each other. That is so disrespectful to our creator. And yet, people want to do that because they want to make it casual and, and informal. Well, look at Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. We want to notice when God appeared at Mount Sinai, not that they actually saw him, but his essence, they knew he was there at Mount Sinai. Notice how the people reacted to that. It wasn't casual at all. Exodus 19 and verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. <coughs> they trembled. They didn't treat God like everybody else. They knew God was not everybody else. He's not like us. They understood that. Turn over to the New Testament, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. When Jesus performed the miracle of putting the, all the fish in the nets, of the apostles. He filled their nets with fish. Notice how Simon Peter reacted when Jesus did this. Luke 5 and verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, saw the miracle, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Simon Peter knew he was in the presence of God, and he knew he was not worthy to be in the presence of God. He didn't give Jesus a high five. He didn't treat him like 
a friend, he knew what he was dealing with. And he showed that respect, that reverence. This is the Son of God. He's not just anybody. We must not treat the worship of God as some kind of informal, casual, common event that's no different than anything else. The worship of God should be the most special, important thing that we do every week. It should be. If it's not, that's a problem. We all have a lot of things to do, but we need to act properly. We need to dress properly, show the proper respect for God. Don't take this as, you know, yeah, I'm headed to the bowling alley or I'm going to the lake or this is something very different that we should show the proper amount of reverence for. And we don't want to try to bring God down to our level. We can't do it no matter how bad we want to, but we shouldn't even want to do that. We're, we're trying to raise ourselves up to be Christ-like. We don't want to bring him down to human culture. And that, yet that's what some people want to do to attract people to come in. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We want to notice something else about a lot of these contemporary services. A lot of them, and, he, and again, you can go, you can see a lot of them, they video it like we video a lot of our services, and they'll video, and they'll put them on YouTube or wherever. And you can see a lot of these, and some of them especially, they are incredibly chaotic. There is so much stuff going on. And they, they got the band, and they got, you know, the music is really loud, and they got strobe lights and laser light shows, and I'm like, is this a disco party? Is this a worship service? What's going on? You can't keep up with everything that's going on. Well, you think God would be okay with that? Look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. God said, let all things be done decently and in order. There is a certain way that God wants things done, and it's not up to us to get to decide, well, we think this would be great, so we're going to do this. We have to stick to what the Bible says and what God tells us the order of worship is. That's what we must follow. Because, again, if I'm really a child of God and, and I really, you know, was, talked about Amy Grant last night, well, we've we got to love God and love our fellow men. Right. If I really love God, shouldn't I want to do what he said? Shouldn't I want to please him? I should. Well, another problem with this, isn't this kind of like bribing people in a sense? Trying to get them to come to, well, well, it'll be really cool and entertaining. You're going to have a blast if you just trying to beg them to come in, offering all these entertaining options if they'll come to services. But you're bringing them in. I mean, that's the wrong reason for them to be here. And yet that's what they're doing. We have to want to be here, to praise God, to worship God, to honor Him, to glorify Him. I have to want to do that. I don't need to have somebody drag me in with something else. God should be the attraction. His Word should be the attraction. And I, I know just speaking for myself, and I, I hope everybody in here agrees with me, like the Bible says, I look forward to Sundays and Wednesdays. I look forward to to gathering together with my brothers and sisters at Etowah so we can worship God together. I genuinely treasure those moments, and I can't wait. We're all supposed to have that attitude that I'm excited to be there, not because they're going to lure me with a laser light show, but because, hey, we, we get to study God's Word. We get to find out what He wants from us, what He wants us to do. Again, what can we do for Him? And knowing that, hey, if we're engaged in the proper kind of worship, we are making the creator of all things happy. How could we not be happy about that? We shouldn't want to come here so we're going to get entertained. We shouldn't want to come here so, well, maybe I'll get a door prize or a gift. Some churches give door prizes. There have been some churches that actually have resorted to paying people as soon as you come in the door, we'll give you a $20 bill or a $50 bill just for coming. You think their attendance went up? Well, yeah, it did. But did they come for God or did they come for the money? 
And there's no way you can make those people study. Why don't you just walk in, take the $50 bill, turn around, walk right back, hey, thanks for the money. Right? But they're certainly not there for the, the sermon. They're not there for the lesson. They're not there to sing together. They, they came because they were bribed to come. But some churches are doing that. Well, look at John chapter 4, because we want to notice God will not accept that. We just read that about there is such a thing as acceptable worship. Getting people there because of entertainment is not acceptable worship. Those people, I'm sure, again, they're sincere, they mean well. Well, yeah, but we get more people in. I get that. But we got to do what's pleasing to God. So look at John chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, that implies there are false worshipers, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, we know what truth means. We've talked about it. This, you know, We can't follow false doctrine. We've we got to preach God's truth. What does he mean, worship God in spirit? we got to have the right attitude, that reverence, that godly fear, because we love God. That's the right attitude. That's worshiping God in spirit spirit okay again if i'm here just for money or i'm here because we're going to have fireworks afterward you know if i just show up for that but i really don't care that much about god but then i can say hey i, I was at church and how can we convince ourselves that god's really going to be happy with that? i'm not worshiping him in spirit if i'm here for any other reason except i want to please him i want to glorify him that's what this means. So we see here true worshipers, and God seeks true worshipers. He has no use for the false worshipers unless they repent and do what they're supposed to do. Well, another problem with this is it demonstrates a lack of faith, a lack of confidence in the gospel. Turn over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to see that according to God, we don't need all that other stuff. At least we shouldn't. The gospel is all we need. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the power of God unto salvation. Nothing else is necessary. Now, do we believe that or not? Either God is telling me the truth here or he's lying to me. If God says the gospel is all we need, then I believe the gospel is what we need. We don't need all that other stuff. All through the book of Acts, we see that the gospel was, that's what they needed. That's what they used. Okay, Jesus and his apostles, they didn't use ever they didn't use entertainment to try to bring in converts. You, you can't find one example of that anywhere in the Bible. And Jesus is our great example. Shouldn't we do what he did? He preached the gospel. That's what he did. He didn't use any entertainment. In fact, if you look at John chapter 6, we want to see that Jesus spoke out against those who followed him for the wrong reasons. Again, worshiping God in spirit, in the right Spirit. If you do it in the wrong spirit, it's not pleasing unto God. So look at John 6 and verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. You don't seek me because you want the truth. You came for the free food. That's why you follow me. Kind of sounds like, when we talked about a while ago, kind of sounds like the coffee and donuts, doesn't it? Now, and are you saying that we can't have a fellowship hall, we can't have milk? No, we did that the other day. We did that. Nothing wrong with that. Okay? I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is if that's why we're here, if somebody, if I'm only going to come for the food, 
Well, I guess I'll stay for the worship service. I don't really want to, but they got good they got good cooks over there, Patty, so I'm gonna go there having a meal. I'm gonna have, if that's why we show up, and for some people, that's why they show up. After services last night, when some friends came up uh, to support me, appreciate that. And so we went out to dinner after the services, and the waitress was talking about, we were telling her we'd been to a gospel meeting and that sort of thing. She was talking about, yeah, I, you know, I, I get up and go on Sunday morning uh, because they always provide breakfast. That way I don't have to fix it. Wow. Oh, that's why you get up. Got, well, I don't have to scramble my own eggs. They'll do it for me. That's the kind of, you know, is she there for the right reasons? Well, doesn't, I mean, based on what she said, it doesn't sound like it. Maybe that's not the only reason she goes. Is, but for a lot of people, they're there for the, the food or, or whatever, and that's what Jesus said. You, you're not following me for the right reasons. He rebuked them. He called them out for that. Right? So the word is sufficient. If people's hearts are right, people's hearts are honest, then the word is sufficient. We don't need... As the Romans called it, the bread and circuses. We don't need all that. Well, let's get back to that idea of people saying, well, yeah, but times have changed. And they have. Nobody can argue that, right? Times have changed, and the church has to change with the times. you you, you got you to gotta get with the 21st century. Well, turn over to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. We need to notice something. We need to remember something. The time period doesn't matter. <clears throat> Whether it's the first century or the 21st century makes no difference. Look at Matthew 24 and verse 35. God has given us a pattern for worship, and that doesn't change. Okay, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, okay? God's word, whatever he has told us, it's eternal. For as long as this earth stands, this word will not change. And wouldn't we want God to be that way? Do we really want a wishy-washy God who changes his mind all the time? Well, last week that was a sin, but now it's okay. No. I'd rather have God who's solid as a rock. God said, this is right, this is wrong, it always will be, it's the way it is. Right, so... First century, 21st, well, this book is so old. I mean, you can't expect us to actually follow this. Well, whether or not I expect it is irrelevant, but God expects it. Because his word is eternal and it doesn't change. And think about what they're really saying. If they want to make these, well, we, we've got to update the church and we've got to get with the 21st century. What they're saying is God is behind the times. Like Jesus said, right, when they were telling the apostles, they're going to reject, but they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So these people that say, well, we need to update, that's, they're rejecting God's plans, what they're doing. Well, God doesn't know what he's doing. Well, I know God said worship should be like this, but we think this would be so much better. So what these people are doing, they think they can do it better than the way God said to do it. Now, how much arrogance does that take? Well, we can design a worship service better than the one that's described in the Bible. Wow. I, don't, I know, for a fact, sorry to say, I don't think, I, I know there is nothing that I can do better than God. Nothing. And that includes designing a worship service. I just need to stick, okay, God wants us to do these things, that's what we're going to do. But that's what these people do. As I said last night, and so I'm going to say it again tonight, to emphasize it, right? It's not up to God to change for us. It's not up to God to get with the 21st century. It's up to us to change for God. We need to go with his path. We don't need to try to force him in what the world wants us to do. That's not acceptable, and that's not being a true worshiper of God, which as we saw, that's what God wants. Now, look at 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Let's go back to that idea of eliminating the negative. Right? Well, we don't want any negativity. Everything's got to be positive. The simple fact of the matter is that about two-thirds of the scriptures are negative. 
2 <laughs> Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, notice, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Two of those three things are negative. Okay? But when you think about it, is it really negative? In one sense it is, but the idea is that God is telling us what is for our own good. Okay? When, think about when your parents, you know, you start to stick that hand on that hot stove when you're three years old. You know, mom's like, you know, look at your mom like, what would you do that for? We call that negative. Well, she didn't want me to sear the skin off my hand, right? She said, hey, don't do that. That's painful. That's going to hurt you. That's what God, if, when he tells us not to do something, it's because he knows it's going to hurt. This is going to be bad for you. God is saying, trust me. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust your friends. Don't trust your neighbors. God is saying, trust me. And when I give you something that you think is negative, I'm trying to save you from a lot of heartache down the road. We need to have that attitude. Say, God's trying to protect me. He's looking out for me. Because I'm really too stupid to look out for myself. I think I can do it, but I really can't do it. I need him to tell me, no, Mark, you know what? That's a bad idea. Don't, you don't want to do that. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that's it. No, 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 you don't want to do that. And I just need to listen to him. And he speaks to me. He's not going to literally tell He speaks to me through his word. And that's what we got to do. So, you know, these people that, well, we can't have anything negative because I understand. They said, well, we don't want to bring anybody down. But, again, if you never talk about the negative, what you're doing, I'm sure it's unintentional, but what you're doing is you're giving people a false sense of security. You're giving them a false sense of their own righteousness. If you never tell them that there's anything wrong about the way they're living. We must be told if and when we are not living up to God's standards because our souls are on the line. Okay? If I'm doing something that is sinful against God and it's going to cause me to lose my soul and you know about it, I'd really appreciate it if you tell me. Hey, you know what, Mark, you, what you're doing there? And show me in the Bible. Here, this, you know, God said that's, you can't do that. Now, I may get mad, but that's my problem, not yours. That's my bad attitude. I need you to tell me. Because you know what? Hell sounds like a really bad place to me, and I don't want to go there. So I'm doing something wrong. I would love for somebody to correct me, biblically, of course, and say, this is what you need to do. And remember, last night we talked about the ex-homosexuals, and that's one of the things that common when you see the interviews with them, they all say, why didn't somebody tell me the truth? Why didn't somebody tell me? We need people to tell us the truth, and sometimes that's negative. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's not really what we want to hear, but it's what we need to hear to get us to heaven, which is where we all want to go. <clears throat> and we've got to live up to God's expectations. Well, it also is really given false promises. Turn over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'll read several verses here. We want to notice that Jesus never told his apostles, his disciples, he never told them to make the gospel more attractive, make it attractive to the world, boys. He never told them to do that. He told them to move on. If people were not receptive to the word, the word is sufficient. Look at Matthew 10, verse 14. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Try to teach them. They're not receptive to that. We're not going to sugarcoat it for them just to try to bring them in. We're not going to entertain them just to bring them in. If they won't obey the word, move on, try to find more fertile soil somewhere else. That's what our Lord told us to do. No chasing after them with promises of excitement or entertainment. Jesus didn't lure his disciples by entertaining them. You won't find one example of that. He didn't promise them exciting adventures. Oh, follow me, it's going to be wonderful. God's going to be just like an amusement park. Jesus didn't do that. Rather, Jesus told them how hard it was going to be. 
He'd say he's not really a great recruiter because he's given them all the, there's that negativity again. But he wanted them to understand, look, you want to follow me? Let me tell you what's going to be involved when you follow me. Because people, it's easy to say, oh, I want to follow you, Lord. Do you really? Like he said, you want to drink of the cup I'm going to drink from? Do you? Let me tell you what that's going to be like. So look still there in Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. Being a Christian is not for the faint of heart. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as servants, serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Staying in Matthew 10, look at verse 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So we're going to be hated. That's the bad part. But the good news is, if we endure, we're going to gain our salvation. But we're going to have to suffer first. Then if you look at Matthew 10, we won't take the time to read it, but verses 34 through 39, Jesus even tells us about it's going to tear families apart. Some of your worst enemies are going to be people in your own household. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a soul. You want to follow me? There's a cost. Okay? So you're not promising, you know, oh, this is going to be wonderful, guys. You're going to love it. Now, that, that's where heaven comes in. Oh, you're going to love that. But in the meantime, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. Okay, look at verse 38. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Take up your cross and follow me. We know what it means to take up the cross. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to suffer. This is not going to be a cakewalk. Look at John 6. Again, in John 6, Jesus, again, he's talking about the cost of following him. But we want to notice after he tells them this, we see the wrong reaction and the right reaction. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 66. Notice after he's just told them some hard truths. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Thought, well, gosh, I didn't know it was going to be like that. I, you know, I don't want to follow you, man. This is tough. Keep reading, verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Now here's the correct response. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Where else would we go, Lord? Yeah, we know you've told us it's going to be tough, but there's nowhere else to go. And again, our reward in heaven is going to be greater than we could ever possibly imagine. It will make the suffering that we go through down here look like nothing. Because again, life is but a vapor. All this will be gone shortly. And if we're faithful, we can be in paradise. And that's, that's what counts. Jesus didn't make it easier on them so they wouldn't leave. You know, he didn't say, oh, those guys left. I better, he just said, you boys are going to leave too? I'm not going to change anything. It's the way it is. And they didn't leave. Some say, well, the miracles kept them. But remember, Jesus did the miracles to prove who he was and to teach the truth. He never did one single miracle to entertain him. It wasn't a magic trick. He didn't do it to entertain people. He could have attracted more followers with the promise of an easier life. Oh, I'll solve all your problems if you follow me. He could have done that. He would have had the power to do that, but he didn't. Churches today, they can bring in more people with entertainment. There's no doubt about that. I don't dispute that for one second. You can bring a whole lot of people in if you're going to entertain them. But the question is, are those people real, genuine Christians if they're not there for the right reason? We need genuine Christians who are here for the right reasons, just like Jesus wanted genuine disciples. People must follow Christ because he is the truth, not because the assembly is entertaining. So when we evaluate, when we look at the scripture, when we evaluate the worship assembly, we should not ask, 
What are we doing to draw a bigger crowd? That's the wrong question for us to be asking. But rather, we should be asking, is what we're doing in harmony with scriptural truth? That's what we want to, is our worship service, is this acceptable to God? That's the question we need to ask and answer in the affirmative. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. Because this may sound a little weird at first, but it's not our job to convert the world to fill the pews. We are to sow the seed without sugarcoating it, without false promises. And you see there 1 Corinthians 3, 6, who will give the increase? God will. I've, I've often told the brethren at, at Etowas that God's not going to hold us accountable for how many people we baptize. God will hold us accountable for how many people we teach, how many people we talk to. When, whenever we get an opportunity, do we seize that opportunity? That's what we're going to be held accountable for. Because I can't force anyone to convert to obey the truth. I can't hold a gun to their head and say, okay, jump in that water. Well, they didn't really get baptized. They just, you know, they were trying to save their skin. So they just got wet. I can't force anybody to convert. What I can do and what God requires me to do is to take opportunities to talk to people. And they may spit in my face, they may slap me, they may close the door. So be it. Again, shake the dust off your feet, move on. But my responsibility and yours is to seek those opportunities. We can't make them do it. God will give the increase. So let's let him handle that part. We need to sow the seed. And that's what he wants us to do. So today's standard seems to be, number one, does what we're doing, we've talked about this all week, does it create a favorable public opinion? Or will the culture like us better if we do this? That, that seems to be today's standard. And number two, does it provide personal enjoyment? Right? Am I going to be entertained about it? That seems to be today's standard. But our standard must be, is it acceptable to God? Is it pleasing to God? The Bible contains God's standard of worship, and it must be our only standard, our only source of authority. As we've said this week, our only source of what is right and wrong, what is moral and immoral, what is good and evil. God has already decided those things. He's already done the hard part for us. He figured it all out. All we have to do is follow it. We don't have to invent it for ourselves. So showtime religion, showtime worship, it's not really worship at all. It's a selfish activity focused on my needs when it ought to be focused on what God wants. If I know I'm pleasing God, then I'm getting something out of the worship service, at least I should. And I know that I do, and hopefully you do too. We should not seek what God can do for us. We should not seek entertainment. Right? We need to be asking again, God's already done enough for us. I need to be about what can I do for him? What can I do that's pleasing to him? And as far as entertainment goes, do we not already have enough opportunities to be entertained in life? We'll be entertained all the time. Not here. This is not our purpose here. I can be entertained out there. I can watch a ball game. I can go to the lake. There's all kinds of things I can do to entertain. But here, I am focused on God and his desires, not my own. And we need to remember that. So may God give us the strength to resist being like the world. May we all respond to the challenges that we've talked about this week that the church faces because if we don't who will we always ask that question and so I'll leave you with this thought just remember Jesus did not fail us the question is are we going to fail him and if you want to please Christ you need to be a Christian and if you're not a Christian tonight we offer the Lord's invitation as always, God has provided the path, the only path, to salvation. Again, the world will tell us all kinds of things, but we got to go what the Bible says, our absolute standard for authority. And God told us that we are to hear the word. 
Romans 10, 17. Hebrews 11, 6 said, without faith it's impossible to please him. We have to believe the word. Luke 13 and 3 says, unless you repent, you will die in your sins. We have to repent for our sins. They change in lifestyle. Matthew 10, 32, 33 says, we have to make that great confession that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then Mark 16, 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. We have to be baptized into Christ. You go out in the water. Again, there's no magic in the water. It's just tap water. The power of the water is in your obedience. And you will go in that water and your sins will be washed away by God. You will be cleansed and you will rise as a new creature. And God will add you to his church. You will then be considered by God a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, a Christian, a child of God. If you have that need tonight, we can help you do that. If you have been a child of God, but for whatever reason, you've gone back into the world, you've been unfaithful, Revelation 2.10 tells us, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. So if we're not faithful unto death, we lose that crown of life. If you've left your faithfulness, you need to come back to it. The good news is God is loving and he wants to forgive you. You need to repent of those sins, confess those sins, pray to God forgiveness, and God's promised he'll forgive you. We can pray with you and for you, and you can be restored to your first love. If you have a need, please come forward. As together we stand and we sing. Amen to Jesus for the cleansing time. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his praise this time? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed are you in the blood, in the, blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed, are you washed in the blood, in the, blood, in the soul-cleansing blood? appreciate Mark so much. Just a, a week of, of great lessons. Uh, I will have to say, I, I was a little offended, Mark, that you seem to come down hard on donuts. <laughs> uh, that cut me deep. You I think I hate donuts? donuts? Well, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, he said something right there in the closing that, that I hope y'all can take with us. May God give us the strength not to be like the world. And that's really, that really very succinctly sums up uh, all the great lessons we've had, not in the way that we live, not in the way that we dress, not in our attitudes, not in the things that we support and believe, and certainly not in our worship, that, that we stand out, that we're peculiar people, that people know that, that that's a Christian because they're not like the world. 
and they're not worshiping like the world, and they don't believe in the things the world believes in. So there's there's nothing there's nothing there. Uh, it's, it's it's all just about how people feel, and and that's short lived because our feelings die with us. Uh, and, and as, as he said many many times, God's message is eternal, His word is eternal, His instructions are eternal, uh, and, and we have that to guide us. So uh, we we appreciate again just the. Uh, some really, really good, uh, great lessons this week. Appreciate Mark being with us. Appreciate you all uh, making the time to come and, and uh, be here for this gospel meeting. Again, remember the Gateway meeting coming up next week. Uh, do our best to try to support them as well. Great speaker uh, to look forward to next week as well. Any announcements we need to make before we dismiss? Turn to number 523. We'll sing the first verse and we'll ask Gilbert if he would to uh, dismiss us. I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light.